Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode here on our Max Colonization series and Oxygen Not Included. Today, we start off with a problem. You can see how low this tank got during the last episode. And to make matters worse, this whole pipe is empty. And the reason why it's empty is because this pump has been disabled by the automation grid. And that's because this thermo sensor is always making sure that this water is warm enough before pumping it out. Except this liquid tepidizer is not submerged in liquid, so it's not heating anything up. Now the issue isn't completely dire. You can see that we barely didn't have enough. Some of these trees still have polluted water that they're drinking. Additionally, we still had enough water to be able to feed our carbon skimmer. And then finally, our home colony never even felt the effects because we had these five buffer tanks. And this is all because I threw caution to the wind and planted more trees than I was supposed to. On this planetoid, we're feeding 14 arbor trees. Add in two more on Frostine, and that's a total of 16 arbor trees. When we did the math, we realized we only had 852 kilos worth of polluted water to work with. Well, when each arbor tree requires 70 kilos polluted water, that means that one geyser can only support a little over 12 arbor trees. And that presents a problem, because this entire colony is running off of that lumber. First, by turning all that lumber into ethanol, feeding it to our petroleum generators, and then taking all the polluted dirt from the ethanol distilleries and providing oxygen. Now, in the long term, it's not going to be an issue because we're going to be creating petroleum, feeding it to petroleum generators, and then we can reclaim the polluted water from the petroleum generators. That was at least the thought. Unfortunately, each petroleum generator requires two kilos worth of petroleum per second in order to produce us 750 grams per second of polluted water which would be enough polluted water to feed six plus more arbor trees. But we're only running 28 slicksters. And when you do the math, taking into account that each slickster only gives you 10 kilos worth of crude oil per cycle, that's only going to eventually net us a little under half a kilo of petroleum per second, which is only enough petroleum to run a petroleum generator about 25% of the time, which means we'd only get about 25% of this polluted water, which when you do all that math, only turns out to be about 112 kilos per cycle or about one and a half more arbor trees. So needless to say, we have a long-term problem. And I say long-term because we still have plenty of polluted water on the colony, but in order to keep the circle alive going, we're gonna need to find another solution. Because each ethanol distillery requires what comes out to be about 1.8 domestically growing trees or about 7.2 wild trees. So we can count these trees as supporting one ethanol distiller, which means we need to account for eight more ethanol distillers, which means a little over 14 domestically growing trees. But as we've shown, we just don't have the polluted water to support that. And the best way I can think of is to plant a lot more wild trees. First, a quick makeover here. I really wish I could explain this to you. This one was probably my fault and maybe a little bit of Travis. But I guess since they're already in there, they can do something for me. Come on, Jack, you're running out of oxygen. Never let go, Jack. Well, that's odd. It didn't create my tile like I had planned. We put Jack's life in risk for nothing. All right, buddy, why don't you come on out? There's definitely some interesting mechanics in here. For instance, we can deconstruct this door and nothing happens. Whereas I did the same thing here and it worked just fine. I wonder if it'll still create the tile if there's a duplicate in there. Let's try it. Good luck, John. Well, John ruined it. It doesn't create the tile. During this whole process, I've also managed to pick up another dupe. This bubbles here was just the rancher we've been looking for. They also have researching and that plus three in science is gonna help them level up their husbandry just a little bit faster. Welcome to the colony, Lady Ruff. And that's the long story that led to this. Now, all of these arbor trees took an awfully long time to get planted. First, I had to make sure there was a natural, I'll put that in air quotes, cobalt ore tile in every single spot where there's going to be a tree. Then I had to bring pips over here. I had to bring the arbor acorns. And then what's worse is the arbor acorns and the pips kept bugging out. I had to restart what felt like maybe a dozen, two dozen times. I'd get three or four planted and then I have to go back to the drawing board. And then I realized something else. These hanging pots were actually getting in the way of these arbor trees being planted, which I never really thought about these plants actually getting in the way of something else being naturally planted by a pip. 
But I suppose they do. Now we can get them all replanted. We made the levels pretty far apart, and that way the pips wouldn't have any issue being able to plant them. We could have probably saved on one more tile in here, but I wanted to make sure the spacing was even. You know how that goes. Now we have to set up our automation. The middle and bottom row aren't going to be too bad. The top row, we're going to have to come up with another solution because the auto sweepers and the conveyor loaders just won't fit in here unless we wanted to sacrifice some lumber. And I don't feel like sacrificing any lumber. I also wanted to point out the issue we're having with some priorities. I'm going to have to go through and double check everything because the dupes seem to be falling behind on tasks. Recently, I had to increase the priority on the Atmo suit docks just so they deliver more Atmo suits. And I've double checked all the priorities and I haven't found one that might be causing the insane amount of backlog that we have. We have a lot of shipping on this colony, which is supposed to reduce the amount of dupe labor we need. I mean, in this case, this is a simple go pick up some water and drop it off at this bottle emptier. And the queue is in the hundreds. And while some of it, for instance, here on Eric W, is just dropping off some supplies, when we go further down, you can see there really is just a lot of stuff going on. Here's one we had for some reason. Might need to get rid of this. We had originally put this storage bin here to drop off a couple of eggs from the printing pod, but we haven't needed it for quite some time, so we're gonna make sure we deconstruct that one. This could also be the source of some of our problems. This is 150 slicksters, and that's just under here. Above here, there's another 46. I've put in some pneumatic doors to try to make sure that they will not come out anymore. The idea is that you don't want them to come out, because you want them to stay in the oil so that they drown. And unfortunately, these slicksters are like floating on top of the oil. And normally when you have problems like this, the first thing you want to check is all the storage bins. Some of the storage bins don't need to be at a priority of 5, they can be at a priority of 4. Additionally, when you're running as much automation and shipping as we are, it makes sense to set these storage bins at 1. Because the auto sweeper is going to do all the delivery for it, so it doesn't make sense to have the duplicates do it, so we make it very low on the duplicate priority list. You also want to check to make sure you don't have any infinite loops. We didn't, because I have this pitcher pump disabled. But I have been siphoning some of the water out of here, and if I didn't disable this one, they would keep pumping it from here and dropping it right back off. One thing I do know that is taking a long time, and the reason why we brought Lady Ruff into the colony is, we have a lot of ranch requirements. We have these four ranches here, two ranches here, hello little cuddle pips, and then three ranches here. And that's not to mention all the deliveries we have to make to incubators. One good aspect, I suppose, is the only ranch that requires us to drop off its food are the sage hatches, and we're doing that by shipping. But despite me checking in a lot of different areas, I still haven't found the cause. And I can tell you it wasn't like this last episode, so I'm not sure what I did wrong. If you have any shots in the dark, please let me know in the comments below. With this automation in, it's time to automate the first row. And that's where we get to welcome back our old friend. And that's our buddy Sweepy. Now, Sweepy's not the fastest around, but quite frankly, we don't need a lot of speed when it comes to this lumber. We have a pretty good back stock, so Sweepy is just the bot for the job. Now, we're going to lose one branch here, but that's not a big deal. I could have also just put a tile here and then move Sweepy over a little bit, but I don't like the idea of covering up the fire pole. Now, one thing I'm going to keep an eye out for is I don't want Sweepy picking up any of these eggs. Unfortunately, we can't control what Sweepy picks up. So we're actually going to add another conveyor loader. And this conveyor loader's job is just going to be able to drop off everything else but the lumber that Sweepy ends up picking up. Uh, I suppose I have to move this over just one so that auto super is not in range. There, that'll work out just fine. And then on this conveyor loader, we're just going to select everything and then deselect lumber. Well, that was kind of pointless. It looks like Sweepy doesn't pick up the eggs. Maybe this is one of the reasons why the dupes have so many extra tasks. I keep building things that I don't have to build. With all of these trees planted, it means we're going to be able to uproot a couple of these. Right now, we're feeding all those trees the polluted water that we have on the planetoid itself. But once that runs out, we will reduce our polluted water requirement down to 10 trees here. And then with these two trees over here, that'll give us the 12 trees this cool slush geyser can support. Since we were over on Frosty, I wanted to show you that this carbon skimmer absolutely crushed all this carbon dioxide. Now, it probably took more cycles than I realized because this project took forever. The puffs are going to be dropping all sorts of oxalite, bleach stone, and slime. All right, dupes, I really am sorry. This is the last time, I promise.
And out of all the objects we could have Sweepy display, Lumber isn't one of them. That makes me very sad. Sweepy was going to be sort of a champion of Lumber collection, and he was going to display his stack of Lumber with pride. I guess an Arbor Acorn also works. We had a couple of updates in our industrial sauna. I ended up adding that second rock crusher back because I started seeing some gaps on the conveyor rail. I think this is more related to the dupes being so behind on tasks, but just in case, I figured the second one would do as well. We also ended up moving the natural gas setup from this level to this level. And the reason was pretty simple. With all the polluted water coming out of these natural gas generators, I wanted to make sure they were in the hottest part of the industrial sauna. And being flanked by these two volcanoes and the three thermal aqua tuners, it's a pretty safe bet that all that polluted water is going to instantly flash. We wouldn't be worried about it going off because there's a ton of pressure in here. But this way it's even better because all that polluted water will instantly flash the steam. And that is where our second project comes into play. Because all that polluted water is instantly flashing the steam, we're now at about 20 kilos worth of steam. It wouldn't take long for there to be hundreds of kilos of steam inside this industrial sauna. So we're going to move it. In fact, we're going to move it and turn it into water at the same time. We're going to build another chiller right about here. So we're going to move some of these rails around so I have a big enough spot to work in. But the idea is we'll send the steam right through the chiller, convert it to water, and then use that water somewhere in the future of our base. In fact, we're actually going to set up two of them. And the reason why, in the comments, Master Marv said, might try aluminum metal tiles instead of polluted water for your cooling rails to go through. 205 thermal conductivity versus polluted water is 0.58. Also, you get better heat conductivity by running it through solid blocks versus gas or liquid. And that's a very valid point. We've used this same setup with metal blocks before. And the reason why we're going to test out the difference is because one metal tile is only 100 kilos of mass. Whereas each tile inside the Debris Cooler 4000 has 1,000 kilos of polluted water. So potentially this is 10 times the thermal mass. Or at least that was my thinking. And we're definitely going to try our best and see if Master Marf's point is correct. So we're going to be using aluminum metal tiles. And they do have that thermal conductivity of 205. But one disadvantage of the metal tile is it only has a specific heat capacity of 0.91. Whereas the polluted water has a specific heat capacity of 4.179. And for those of you who are still struggling to figure out specific heat capacity versus thermal conductivity, one of the best examples I've heard, imagine a large bucket filled with water. The size of the bucket is your specific heat capacity. And if you put a hole in the bottom of the bucket, the size of that hole is your thermal conductivity. How fast is that water gonna leave versus how much water can that bucket hold? Something just showed up in the printing pod and I wanna explain what happened. While I was planting all these trees, I was using storage bins to transfer the arbor acorns from one level to the other. And one of the bugs I ran into, arbor acorns no longer showed up in the seed category. And it happened more than one time to where then all of a sudden our arbor acorns just sort of blanked out. And it was around this same time that pips wouldn't even pick up the arbor acorns, or if they did, they would spit them out immediately after. So I went into debug mode. Some of you may be aware that once you go into debug mode, the map believes you've seen every single critter in the game. And this is the unfortunate side effect. Since the game believes you've seen the critters, the printing pod will start offering them to you. Now don't you worry, I have zero intentions taking a critter the easy way instead of going to discover it on another planetoid ourselves. But I still thought it was interesting to show you. So we have our area cleaned up and everything rerouted. We had to reroute all the gas pipes and all the shipping, and that way nothing was interfering with this. I would have made it a little bit bigger, but I don't want to move this heavy walk conductive joint plate. Not to mention, once we're done with our side-by-side -side sample, this is going to be plenty of room to chill that steam. And our little experiment is built We've pretty much mirrored the flow of steam through both of these sections. One is filled with nine aluminum metal tiles, and the other nine tiles with about a thousand kilos of polluted water in each tile. Now in our coolant pipes, we could have done two thermo aqua tuner setups to truly mirror the experiments, but we're going to get the temperature so low in both of these compartments, it's not going to matter. The metal tiles are already sitting around minus two and a half, 
the polluted water still has a little bit ways to go. Now this could be an indication that the tiles are going to win out. But remember, their thermal conductivity is a lot higher. So yes, they're going to reduce in temperature very quick, but they're also going to raise in temperature very quick. Now once our experiment's complete, we're going to combine the two because there's no reason for us to have two setups. So this part of the experiment is the same. We have a gas valve here and it is set to 100 grams per second. 100 grams is important because at 100 grams, the gas is not going to state change. In other words, it's not going to go from steam to water once it falls below 97 degrees. And then finally, for the purposes of the experiment, we do have two thermo sensors. One for the metal tiles that's going to measure the temperature and then one for the polluted water. We're already down to about six and a half degrees. So give me a few more cycles to let this drop a little bit further and then we'll kick it off. Now would be a great time to place your bets in the comments below. The polluted water is now at 2 degrees and the metal tiles are about minus 5. I don't want the metal tiles to start getting too cold, but that's all going to change once the steam starts going through. Now we're going to look at the first reading, but we're also going to wait a few minutes and see how the readings end up then as well. That way we're not just testing the immediate thermal conductivity, but rather the long term effect of thermal conductivity with the specific heat capacity. And to start it off, all we have to do is reconnect the pipes. And now we're going to get to see how our experiment goes. Steam's coming in at around 136 degrees. And the first packets are out. The steam that went through the polluted water is at 2 degrees. The steam that went through the metal tiles is at minus 3.5. Now all we're doing is we're letting the steam come out. It instantly flashes to water. And then the water gets sent to the liquid reservoirs until we figure out what we're going to do with it. While we're giving that experiment a little bit of time, I figured I'd show you the beauty that is these natural gas pipes. The storage is working out absolutely wonderful. Now, granted, this natural gas geyser still has 42 cycles until its next dormancy. So even these pipes are probably going to fill up. But we have plenty of room for activities down here. We can throw another 500 to 1,000 pipes. And if you have problems falling asleep, well, you can always listen to the natural gas ASMR stream. Well, I'm ready to call a winner. There's a couple of hints here. First, the metal tile is at 0.1 degrees. The polluted water, on the other hand, is at minus 1.2. The steam, and while it's very, very close, coming out of the metal tiles is minus 0.2. The steam coming out of the polluted water is minus 0.4. There is a small problem with the experiment though, but it actually leans in metal tiles favor, which may add more credence to polluted water being better in this instance, because the temperature sensor told it to, the coldest coolant is gonna cool these metal tiles first before heading down to the polluted water. So for this experiment to be 100% precise, we would have needed to set up two aqua tuners and had two closed loops. Like I said before, I wasn't willing to go through all that effort because again, we're gonna combine these. And in this case, I think we're going to stick to the polluted water. Although I got to say, it is very, very close. So whether you want to use aluminum metal tiles or polluted water, I don't think it makes a big difference one way or the other. But as for other metal tiles, for instance, copper, gold, or anything like that, I'd stick to the polluted water. Because I believe the only reason this metal tile is standing a chance is because it's aluminum. I was going to go ahead and combine them, but then I realized... What's the point? This is working perfectly just the way it is. We're going to get rid of these thermo sensors and reconnect our fire pole. But other than that, I think this system is about done. The only thing left to do is to add an Atmos sensor. We're going to shoot for sort of the middle of the sauna. And then we'll connect it directly to the gas pump. Now in practice, there's probably some better ways to do this to capture more of that steam. For instance, we could use a door system to push all the steam into a room, chill it all in mass, and capture a lot more water all at once by doing that. Because as it stands, with us only pushing 100 grams per second of steam, that only comes out to be 60 kilos of purified water per cycle. Not a whole lot, but at the minimum, it's nice and chilled. We're going to set the Atmos sensor as high as it goes, and that's 20 kilos. So whenever this room gets more than 20 kilos worth of steam pressure, the gas pump will start taking it out using this system. I know this was a little bit of a shorter episode, but I promise you it wasn't shorter for me. This new wild ranch took a lot of cycles, and it'll probably be the last time I do something like this, at least for another patch or two, because wow was it buggy. Next episode, I think we're going to start with the geothermal aspect of our petroleum boiler by digging down into this magma 
and capturing some of that beautiful heat, that'll give us a little bit more time to collect some more crude oil. Now it's not gonna be anything huge because the Slicksters don't produce that much oil for us to put through some huge petroleum boiler, but at a minimum, it will be enough for our space program, at least the space program for this planetoid. I'm not convinced that this colony is gonna be the centralized spaceport for all of the other planetoids. For one, there's no natural water supply. All the water we're getting from this planetoid is being fed to our trees. And one of the requirements for a star map spanning spaceport is going to be liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, which we need water for. I'd love to hear your suggestions and see if you have any other ideas on what is possible on this planetoid. I look forward to reading them. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll talk to you soon.